Welcome back, everybody, to the DanJohnUniversity.com podcast. I'm Dan John, and this is episode 212. And if you're into Fahrenheit, we're boiling. Of course, a whole bunch of people around the world don't get that joke. Uh, Celsius, 100 degrees. I'll move on. Hey, welcome back. Remember, if you have questions, you email them to me at podcast at DanJohnUniversity.com. I'll do my best to answer each and every question, even if sometimes I don't even know uh, the whole context of what's going on. And that brings us to question number one. I'm not a real basketball fan. Uh, I used to work with basketball teams a long time ago, but I really don't follow it anymore. But this makes it a fun question. Greg asks this. I've got a hypothetical question for you. The San Antonio Spurs have hired you for one job. You need to help their rookie seven foot five French phenom Victor and then Wenbeyama. Wenbeyama. Add muscle mass. What program would you build for him? You have whatever resources you need. Well, first and foremost, I know this. We got ourselves a multi million, if not billion dollar asset. And I change how I do things when I work. <laughs> the more expensive you are, the more I change things. I did like the idea of you have whatever resources you need. Um, uh, I did look up the athlete before uh, I answered this question. And I got to tell you something uh, seven foot five guy who can shoot, that's pretty impressive. But he is going to have a hard time in the National Basketball Association because not only are people tall and can shoot well, but they're very physical. Uh, I used to work with a team, and one of the things they taught me over and over is just how difficult that it, at the, I think it's still 82 games, but 82 game season, um, the, the, the season starts basically around December. It might even start in November. And it goes on and on and on like a really bad song uh, at a high school dance. Um, not only do you have the 82 games, you have the preseason games. Uh, you have the playoffs, which seem to go on forever. I think uh, it's, I mean, I always to joke that it's the only league in the world that the preseason is happening uh, while the finals are going on. It's just a long season. Uh, travel is very difficult. And you need... Uh, you need what we call armor. So the first thing is let's remind everybody what armor is. Uh, I mean, obviously, I, I teach the human body in two ways. One is bow. It's bow and arrow, okay? And the bow work is the hinge. That would be any kind of snap work, any kind of kettlebell swing. Uh, the Olympic lifts, uh, plyometrics, sprint work, hill work, anything that takes the athlete and makes the athlete more explosive. But the other side of that is the arrow. Um, the arrow is, uh, uh, I mean, it's, when I break it out, it's pretty simple. First off, the arrow is really put yourself into a, into a guided missile, uh, into, a, into a brick wall. Um, part of that is anaconda strength. And, of course, anaconda strength is that ability to hold your body against this, the, the, what the opposition is trying to do to you. When I reach out my hand to block somebody in an American football game, it's not a tricep extension, no matter what the personal trainer said. Uh, it is a whole body thing. So when you jab that hand into them, it's not a bench press. It's not a tricep extension. It is a whole body lockdown, and you're generating all the po uh, that power. You know, it could just be a targeted place, like this part of the hand <sighs> into this area underneath the shoulder pads. There's, there's a gap there. Um, and then I'm going to try to drive and then just wheel the athlete outside so I can get underneath him and drive him around the quarterback. To be able to hold on like that, that's what we call anaconda strength. Uh, that's why I like the suitcase carry. When, you th uh, when you're doing a suitcase carry, one hand farmer walks, your other side has to lock down to not let that weight sway over. When you throw the discus, you want to stay long and strong out here like this. As, 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 and that's what makes the, the discus go far. But the off side of your body has to lock down in movement, in real time. And you need that internal pressure, internal strength to, get, to master that. And then there's a thing called uh, armor building. And armor building is a real thing. Um, you can get, I mean, I mean, you can get, like you look like you're really big and you can be really strong in the weight room 
and every so often you'll meet people like this. I mean, they look great in the uniform, they look great in the weight room, and they die on the vine in the sport. Uh, very often it's because of a lack of armor. So one of the things I started working on years ago when we started doing double kettlebell work with my high school athletes, one of the running backs said, you know, it's weird, coach. This is, this is what it's like being a veer running back. It's, a, it's an offense where the running backs get the ball a lot. And he said, you know, you're constantly getting hit here. And we had this conversation and we came up with this concept called armor building. So the double kettlebell clean is an armor building exercise. The double kettlebell front squat. And of course, you throw in a military press and you've got the armor building complex. Two double kettlebell cleans. One double kettlebell press. Three double kettlebell front squats. Put the weight down. Your partner does it. I go, you go, I go, you go. And uh, when you go to your next football game and someone hits you, you feel like you've been, you feel like you've seen that before. Weirdly, there's some other exercises that work well. The snatch grip deadlift, strangely, for some athletes, they'll tell me, it, it seems to toughen, toughen them up in certain spots. The best armor building I know overall for everybody, of course, is tumbling and fall training. Now, let's take that back to the question. I think just by my observations, uh, we're gonna have to build some mass on this athlete. From my observations, we're also gonna have to build some uh, anaconda strength. Um, he might be the best finesse athlete uh, in a long time, and that's what I read online. But you know, when someone's elbowing you in, in the sternum, in the ribs, over and over, you need some armor. But we're also gonna have to have anaconda strength because when someone sticks that elbow in you, you don't wanna move, you wanna stay. So for me, what I would do in a perfect situation is the moment we drafted him, we'd have done my Mass Made Simple program. Uh, this poor kid, we'd do the seven week version, uh, two days a week, we'd have him in the weight room doing complexes, lots of bench press, lots of single arm presses, and of course those high rep squats. And you can see it in my book, Mass Made Simple. Um, it's a good book. It's a good program. It always tends to work. I think we need to get him at the table. He's got a, one of the things I'd recommend is, is a technique I used many times. It's a tough one. Uh, it involves sleep and protein shakes. Uh, so when you, okay, I'm going to go backwards on it because then I'll go forward and explain it. First thing you do when you wake up in the morning is you drink a protein shake. Uh, and you want to keep you in that positive nitrogen balance as long as we can. But right before we go to bed, I also want you to take protein, but I also want you to wake up and take protein. Now, I've had some people tell me they've done protein shake at 10 o'clock, set the alarm for 2 or 3 in the morning, protein shake, and then the, the AM uh, protein shake. That might be, this is just our experience, but a better way to do that is half the protein shake at 10 o'clock. Um, many of my athletes say they have, to, because of that, they have to pee on a couple hours, and then you knock down the other half, and the moment you wake up, you, you drink the third. So I'm giving you two options on how to do this uh, protein drink. One, you can do those protein drinks three times in your kind of your sleep cycle. Right before you sleep, four hours in, right when you wake up. Or, half, half full. Both work. Uh, a lot of it kind of depends on the quality. Well, okay, I gotta be careful. It's not the quality of the protein shake, it's how you, how your body likes the protein shake. Um, there are some protein shakes that, like for example, you might love makes me gag. Um, I have found that the brand, I buy a whole bunch at, at Costco. I'm not gonna give you the brand name, but you know, it comes in these little boxes this big and they're 30 grams of protein. I'm kind of surprised how well those go down for me. Uh, the ones you have to blend might not be a perfect option for the first thing in the morning. I mean, I don't know if you want to wake up and go the first thing in the morning. Uh, so pre-made, uh, easy to shake, easy to dissolve protein powders are probably your best bet. So six weeks, the first seven weeks, I guess, the first thing you want to do, we would be doing lots of back squats. We'd be drinking lots of protein. Um, we would try to test creatine on him. Not everybody responds well. Uh, if he gets massive diarrhea or something like that, well, maybe not. 
if he says, I feel good, look good, life is good, then we'll continue on that. After that first six weeks, we're going to probably have to teach him some stuff. This would be a good time. And, and I would, if he doesn't have a background in uh, tumbling and falling, I would do that with him. And that because of the long-term fall prevention work. Plus, if you do it on certain kinds of mats, uh, and anyone who's ever rolled, any of my listeners who've done any kind of fighting art, uh, I did judo but in, uh, and wrestling, uh, uh, American high school wrestling. The first two weeks of high school wrestling, my nose used to bleed right here all the time. After two weeks, it never bled again. Um, the first two weeks of wrestling, you just feel those abrasions from the wrestling mats and the walls and, you know, getting your face rubbed into the mat. After about two weeks, it disappears. That's another kind of armor building. So with the tumbling and the fall training, one of the things I think it helps with is, yes, it does callous the body, true, but it also teaches the person to not take falls the hard way. You roll with the fall, not stop a fall. We're running out of time already because we don't have much of an off season. But what I would like to do as best we can is work with the head coach on the number of minutes they get a night in the beginning so that we can keep lifting weights for the first season, the second season. I wouldn't mind, you know, if we can, if we can you know, let him play, you know, put him in good situations, you know, use his skill set on the field, uh, on the court, but still be kind of focused in the weight room on this and on size production. If we make it to the playoffs, which you probably will in the NBA, uh, maybe back off on the train and see what happens and try to maybe do that two or three seasons in a row. Um, mass building that counts doesn't happen overnight. If you look at the mailman, uh, Carl Malone, and look at his pictures coming out of college versus maybe his 10th year in the league, he looks like a different person. Uh, it takes a while to build up an athlete, especially if you're playing those many games and so many, half of them on the road, all of them are travel, lots of, lots of sleep issues. We'll do our best, but I would see that as a long-term project. It's not a perfect program because you're dealing with a professional athlete and you got to recoup the amount you pay uh, for them very quickly. Fun question, Greg, and thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Um, Mike has a question. He says, in about six weeks, I'll be headed for a 10-day trip to Disney with my kids. Well, good luck. A 10-day trip to a Disney place. That's going to be, A, it's going to be life-changing. You're going to uh, love it. Uh, remember my rules about Disney? Halt. Don't let yourself get hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. I always eat uh on the Disney properties at about lunch at about 10 30 11 o'clock uh, we always go back to the pool in the afternoon to swim for a little bit and then take a nap and then we try to stay up a little bit later because basically the parks in the afternoon aren't the best place in the world to be there's my hint as a father and grandfather so he says lots of walking pushing a double stroller long days He's 40, an ex-competitive hockey player, and already exercising using your programs uh, uh, regularly. Thank you. Given this limited timeline and a desire to be in the best shape to make the trip as easy as possible, do you think it's better to run something like your mountain climbing program, which is six weeks long, or use the workout generator for the next six weeks, four to five times, four to five times a day? That might be a little bit too much. So for those who don't know what he's talking about, over at Dan John University, we have this great little device called the Workout Generator. You type in, the, the, there's a question. What equipment do you have? There's a question. How many days a week do you want to work out? There's a question. You know, and the, and the thing that most people don't utilize best, this is my experience helping other people with it, is when it spits out the program, you can still adapt the exercises um, to, you know, make them, you know, like you can do a, a wall push-up versus a, you know, a decline push-up if you're just using push-ups, you know, so you can really vary the intensity there. Uh, he says, I think he must make a mistake here. He says for the next six weeks, four to five times a day, but I'm going to answer that question as written, Mike, okay? 
Can you use the workout generator four or five times a day? You certainly could, and it'd be an interesting workout. It would be a long time in the gym or in your home gym. But if you dialed it back to those simple variations, like we have one called the wall pike push-up or something like that, very simple uh, variation of the pull, uh, push-up, uh, you could go in. You could go in and combine your strength, hypertrophy, mobility work multiple times in a day, and I think it'd be pretty good. Now, what I think you meant was four to five times a week, and that would work well. Now, the mountain climbing program. Uh, I'm very proud of. Uh, I set it up for someone who got a call from work and they said, we want you to climb Mount Kilimanjaro and, you know, write a beautiful article about it, you know. Oh, great. When? Six weeks. So put together this very, very focused six-week training program. Oh, it's not perfect. And and it's not going to get you ready to, you know, climb K2 and, you know, Mount Everest and Mount McKinley, you know, in a three-week period. But it's pretty good. And pretty good is pretty good. If you want something as organized as the mountain climbing program, I think it will get you ready for the stroller issues, for the carrying the kids on the shoulders and all that. If you did decide just to do the workout generator, that's not bad either. So it's going to come down to this, Mike. With, with the mountain climbing program, uh, there's a lot to do outside of the gym. So if the weather's good, if you can, you know, get the runs in, you can get the sprints in, uh, you can get some hill work in, I would say the, the mountain climbing program. If you don't have an ideal scenario, <laughs> I usually call that life, four to five days a week on the workout generator should be just fine. I will say this for both you and whoever else is going with you, um, all the spouses and grandparents, um, start walking every day. Uh, and make sure you go to Disneyland with a good pair of shoes. Uh, and I also recommend a hat of some kind, not a character hat, but a hat to keep the sun out. Uh, plenty of water and plenty of patience. All right. Uh, as the saying sometimes goes, been there, done that. And uh, it's glorious. But oh my God, there can be uh, issues with the kids. Uh, not with you or even me, but other people. All right. Good luck to you on that. Thank you. Uh, Sebastian asked a question. He says, I started my full-time career as a fighter fighter, firefighter at 21. It's been seven years and I've been loving it. I've often heard in the past recommend barbell and maybe kettlebell complexes to firefighters, but I'm curious, how would you structure a training program to keep a guy healthy and fit for a duty, uh, healthy and fit for duty for a career from say the age of 21 until retirement at roughly 55. Well, as you know, uh, we have an, we have a firefighter in the inner circle and I work with a lot of firefighters. One of the reasons I like complexes so much for firefighters and really any rapid responders, uh, Sebastian, any, any rapid responder, uh, frankly, uh, is that you can get a lot of work in in a very short amount of time uh, you get your mobility work in, you get strength work in, you get power work in, you get hypertrophy work in. In fact, that's that's when it became part of Mass Made Simple is when uh, some of my athletes, their dads who were firefighters, started doing them at the fire station. They were all getting all buffed. And so I figured if it made firefighters feel good, look good, and feel buff, well, win, win, win. So, uh I would say complexes two to three times a week uh, would be a, a solid thing to do. And I I offer you six different complexes. I, I know they're over at Dan John University. Uh, and I also have them blown up so you can just type them out, put them on the floor in front of you. I have six different barbell complexes. I have a couple of kettlebell complexes. I've got the, um, well, the armor building complex. I've got the humane burpee and... Uh, the Butt Blaster 5000 and some of these. Some of those are in the Hardstyle Kettlebell book. A lot of them are right there on the YouTube channel. Um, mixing, uh, you know, it might be a really good idea for you to, to do like two weeks of barbell complexes and then one week of kettlebell complexes. I don't think that's terrible. Uh, I would focus on complexes A, B, and C from my materials. Um, 
for you. Some of the other ones are fine, but they just get a little bit, you know, they start going in different directions. Uh, C has a lot of squats. <laughs> um, I would vary the, the reps and sets every single time as best you can. Five sets of five, three sets of eight, which is much harder than it sounds. Uh, five sets of three, five sets of two. In the book, Mass Made Simple, I, I kind of show you how I play around with those. I use a lot of variation on it. Uh, and that third week, uh, maybe do the armor building complex twice and maybe the humane burpee twice. Two weeks barbell complex, one week uh, kettlebell complexes. I know a lot of firefighters uh, like to do bodybuilding exercises. I know this because of my time with you guys. But I think it's probably a better idea and up to age 55 as best you can. I'd love it for you to have a one day a week, a full mobility workout, one hour plus just getting stuff lubricated, put back in place. One other day a week of some, probably some long cardio, whatever that means. That could be a long bike ride for you. It could be a triathlon for your friend. It could be a long run for somebody else. It could be a swim for somebody else. Like for me, it's a long walk with a, a ruck or heavy hands, something like that, but long. And we're looking at about an hour at least, an hour at least. But the other thing I think a lot of firefighters miss is either hill sprints, which I think would probably be better for what you're asked to do with ladders and things like that, um, or just pure sprints if that's the situation you're in. You could do stadium steps, but some kind of speed work that's not going to damage you. The upside of doing hill sprints, I've never had an athlete get hurt doing hill sprints. I did hurt myself doing stadium steps when I was young. I missed a step because I was an idiot. Um, sprints are great, but you know, you, you got to make sure you're going fresh. You have good technique. You don't, I don't want you to pull a hamstring or something like that. So yes, complexes. Yes. I love the idea three days a week for two weeks with the barbell and then those four workouts with the kettlebell on week three, but you got to get that long, that long distance day in. You got to get the hill sprint day in and you got to get the mobility day in. If you're weightlifting three days a week and you're doing, uh, say like this is a, a make it a week one, day one, you do your complexes, complex A, you do three sets of eight followed by hill sprints. The next workout, complex B, five sets of five and long, slow distance. Uh, the third day, just like complex C, uh, anything you think you need to work on in the weight room. And then the next day, the day four, would be a mobility day and maybe follow that with a long walk. Um, my work, my, I have a lot of family members who are firefighters, you know, um, one of the things that they always say is, you know, you, you know, you, you have to be ready for something that you can't even imagine. That I've been told, it's, when I ask the, you know, how can I help with the training? One of the things that the older firefighters, I mean, my cousin Jim Alio telling me this, one day something's going to happen that you're just not prepared for and you still got to go do the job anyway. So by having that endurance background, those complexes, pushing yourself through, but staying alert and practicing your craft, go to the classes, pay attention, sit up front, take notes, practice all your skill set. Um, if you can, we, we were at a RKC not long ago with a firefighter and we talked about training with masks on. I think there's some, there, there's real value to that if your, if your um, department allows that. Um, and just take care of your stress level, take care of mobility, do the complexes, get the other work in and practice your craft. All right. Thank you. And good luck to you. Okay. That's a, it's a good question. Okay. Chris says this, my last question was, why does two sets of five reps just work? And you answered, I answered it, that really and completely agreed with me. Well, good. My next question is this, which rep scheme, five, three, two, or two, three, five? Now, <laughs> I like it when people do this to me. So if you're doing easy strength, the, the test workout is a set of five, add weight, a set of three, add weight, a set of two, add weight. And you've got to make that double. That's the rule. I don't, there's no, no fuzzy logic. It has to be one, two, 
buckle my shoe, whatever the thing is, okay? So with easy strength, that is the perfect test day workout. I love the word perfect there because, you know, there's nothing perfect, but it's pretty good. Uh, I began to notice with most people, when I asked them what their best singles were, it was it was fantasy world. I mean, it was, uh, it, you know, it was a cartoon show. Uh, you know, their buddy be deadlifted and that weight off their chest and they would count that as their max. But most people don't lie about doubles. And, and I, it's interesting. Uh, in my case, uh, my maxes, my single maxes are up here. My doubles are, are not very good at all. But I know this, I could always do. If I said I could do something for two, I knew I could always do it for one. I'd go untrained for months. So easy strength, five, three, two. When you're doing ladders, it should be two, three, five. And the reason is ladders stay with the same weight. So let's get this clear in our heads. Five, add weight three, add weight two. Ladders, same weight. Do a set of two. That wasn't very hard. Now I'm going to do a set of three. That wasn't very hard. I do a set of five. Woo! But I know I can do a set of two. That was easy. Three, I got that. Five, woo! That was hard. But I know I can do two. So with two, three, five is my favorite strength building ladder. Can you get strong staying with the exact same weight and just keep doing two, three, five, two, three, five, two, three, five, a appropriate weight? Yeah, you can get really strong. Uh, it, it really does teach your body. It's that classic grease the groove. It is the way you teach musicians. You know, uh, <clears throat> they do ladders. It's funny. They, they do scales. We do ladders, and I've actually heard someone one time tell me that scales are ladders, and I thought, well, I just, okay, you blew my mind. But they practice their scales over and over. We do ladders. All of a sudden, the nervous system knows what we want, and we get better. So, Chris, these are good questions, and I hope if there was con any if there was any confusion, I apologize. I know sometimes these things sound like they're the same, but they're radically different in, in practice. Uh, thank you. So Matthew asks this, sort of a vague, subjective question. <clears throat> I'm a 29-year-old ex-college athlete. My overall goals are strength, longevity, and most importantly, whooping my sons in any athletic event for as long as possible. I like that. That's good. My current training is easy strength five days a week, focusing on new lifts every 40-day cycle. So you're using the mild variation, I'm thinking, then that's very good. Uh, with a few periods of hypertrophy focus throughout the year. Oh, good. So it seems like, Matthew, you've read the Easy Strength Omni book. For those who don't know what he's talking about, go to danjohnuniversity.com slash bookstore. And we're talking about wild versus mild variations here. I also hike and mountain bike as often as I can. However, I find that while my strength is going up, I do not have that athletic feeling I once had. I must throw out one small thing. You're 29. Just, I'm going to come back to that in just a second. I miss that lightness and sense of movement I once had. For someone with limited time, young kids, how would you suggest adding some movement that would help with general athleticism? Could a small daily dose of plyometrics help? So it reminds me, we I was 26 years old. I was just back from the Middle East, so I wasn't feeling really good. Um, I was very sick when I got back, and I, I had a lot of issues. I had some issues upstairs. I had some physical issues. I was struggling. And my buddy and I, we went out, we played, uh, we used to play in this little pickup basketball league uh, uh, where you, I was, so you had to be six foot or lower. And I... And I'm a true six footer. So I actually, I actually had the guy do this when he was measuring me because most guys who say they're six foot are about this tall. So it was a nine foot, nine foot rim, nine foot basketball hoops. So not 10, but nine. And we we're playing one time and he went for a layup for nine feet and he's, say he's 5'10, five, 5'11. Five, and he couldn't stuff it like he wanted to. And after the game, he goes, you know, Danny, uh, I feel like I've, I've, I'm, I've lost my step. I've, I've lost the step. And it's funny to think about that because we were 26. And he's, I think he was probably 27 at the time. And we felt like we lost a step. 
Now, why is that interesting is that 20 year, one years later, 21 years later, I had the best year of my discus throwing career. What happens in your 20s? What happens in your 20s is an interesting thing, you know, is you, you start having to mow the lawn, you know, not because dad says so, because you have to mow the lawn. Uh, you start having late nights, not because you're partying, but because you got little kids. Uh, you don't go out and play with your friends every night and day. The way to bring back your athleticism is to play. Um, I think one of the best ways to teach children uh, how to hunt and how to, to protect themselves are those ancient games of tag and hide and go seek. My brother Gary, when he came back from Vietnam, said that, I remember this so well, he said one time, he thought the thing that saved his life was playing hide and go seek as a kid. And I thought that was, that was great. So I don't know what the games you play with your kids are, but you know, uh, go outside and play, uh, whether it's pick up basketball or, you know, just catch or uh, anything you can. Uh, Frank, I think it's Frolinek, uh, has a, a wonderful series of books uh, about play. And I first read his stuff, boy, I think at the dawn of the internet, 98, 99. And his gym is just a playtime. And they play these games that they've put together and everything is fun. Don't forget how to play. Uh, okay, so today uh, I went on a kayak adventure for three hours. After I finish this podcast, I'm going to go out to the lake and I'm going to play in the water for a while. And people will come by and say, are you crazy? You're, what are you doing? The water's too cold. And I'm like, okay, I, I'm 66. And I was like... The, the same reason the same reason when you say how do you stay in such good shape can you not hear this it's because I play in the water and when I play in the water and I go kayaking I go for hikes and play with my kids last night I was playing uh, soccer with these uh, a seven year old and a nine year old and we had this big old big old bouncy ball instead of a normal and I laughed and played and kicked the ball and tried to score goals for a long time. Play. That's the secret to youth. you got to remind yourself that when you hit a certain age, it's not even the age, when you hit certain life experiences, when you're sitting at your desk all day and you commute in traffic and you you got to fill out the Henderson report and you're all angry about this, that, and this, you're not having fun. You're not playing. Play. Um... And a lot of my friends, my daughter is in an adult kickball league. She plays Trivia Pursuit with me on Monday nights, our team. Uh, play. Uh, play cards. I mean, it's even, and I mean this, play cards, play Scrabble, play Yahtzee, play. Have some fun. <sighs> try to try to find that inner child, uh, Matthew, that may or may not be, you know, it's still there. You just got to cultivate it. Plyometrics, play a game of tag and tell me if you're not getting plyometrics in. Okay? All right, enjoy. And I hope that helps. And good luck. 29 is young. So this is our last question today, but I thought it was really good. It's from Harrison. And I know several Harrisons. And if it's one of you, hi, how you doing? He says this, I was wondering if you can offer an effective cool down after a workout of swings and get ups. Okay, there, he has to follow up, but I'll reread the whole question again. But what was interesting about this when I looked this question over, you see, I see swings and get ups, uh, Turkish get ups, very often as the last exercise of doing a workout. I, I think there's something magical about doing five sets of 15 in the kettlebell swing and then going for a, a half hour, 45 minute walk after a workout. Um, that is, I mean, if you want me to summarize easy strain for fat loss in a nutshell, five sets of 15 kettlebell swings, go for a 45 minute walk, go for a half hour, it doesn't matter, go for a walk. Uh, there, there you go, I just saved you, you know, I just saved you some money there. Uh, so, and then the other exercise, Turkish get-ups, uh, one of my favorite ways to 
kind of check in on road trips is Tur Turkish getup. So I'll, I'll go to a gym or even my hotel room and I'll lay down on the floor and I'll just do some Turkish getups. Uh, I might just do some rolling at first. I might check in at certain positions. I do notice sometimes after long flights when I'm in that kneeling windmill position. Um, so my left foot, my left knee, and my left hand are on the ground. My right foot's on the ground. It's a way, it's perpendicular to my uh, right leg. And I'm supposed to have my hand pointed directly at the ceiling, you know, completely vertical. After long plane flights, flights it's, it's here. And so I'll start doing this little pumping motion and try to get myself so I can get back into more like a windmill. I love finishing a workout with an open-ended, uh, we call them naked turkey get-ups. Uh, that's where you don't have a weight in your hand, where you just say, okay, everybody, uh, five minutes, 10 minutes of Turkish get-ups, go. And as an instructor, you kind of go like this. You watch people, you watch people move. You get a chance to look in at Edna with her left knee. And if her left knee's been bothering her, you can look over and see. Yeah, she's really favoring that still. You know, Bob, who showed up really stiff that day, is moving great. The workout helped. It's a great assessment. It's a great warm-up assessment. Hmm, how am I feeling? I'm stiff from my flight. But it's a great post-assessment. Okay, I was stiff, but now it's all back to normal, so I don't need to worry about it that much. I wanted to stop and make sure I said that because you picked two of my favorite last exercises and you asked a different question. To repeat the question, I was wondering if you can offer an effective cool down after a workout of swings and get ups. Would a dead hang from the pull up bar be a good option along with some hip flexor stretching, glute stretch? I've noticed my lower back feels stiff sometimes after my workout and trying to find the reason, whether it be technique issues with the swing or the lack of a cool down. Now, if your lower back hurts after swings, let me quote you what I say it certs. If after I teach you the hinge, the swing, and all those things, if your hamstrings hurt, I'm a great coach. If your lower back hurts, you weren't listening to me. So the first thing, Harrison, and I think I might need, um, what I'd like you to do is Join the forum at Dan John University. And I'd like you to post a video of your swing technique so I can see what's going on. It could be something really simple. It could be something major. Uh, it could be just your technique. You got it off of bad videos on YouTube and you know, you're know you doing a train wreck on every rep versus a, you know, a correctly done uh, kettlebell swing. I... I always joke that I have this perfect mobility workout. I do a 30 second dead hang clean, and then I sit at the bottom of the goblet squat for 30 seconds every day. Um, that's my one minute mobility thing. I have a three minutes to perfection thing I'm working on. That's the one minute meditation. That's the 30 second hang, 30 second um, uh, uh, go sit in the goblet squat. So that's two minutes. And then I spend 30, uh, well, probably one minute, 30 seconds each, looking at my major long-term goals. I have a financial goal and a physical goal. And I just review my to-do list. I review what I've done so far in the day and it, and it keeps me mentally focused. I've got to tell you, that one minute meditation, you can either do it with your, uh, you know, the, your stopwatch and your phone, or like I use, I use one moment meditation, the app. It can be marvelous. Follow that with a stretch. So I meditate, whoo, brings my head down, I hang, opens my shoulders, and well, hope for me it opens everything up. I sit, it opens up my hips, my knees, my ankles. I review my two biggest goals about, am I on track again today? <sighs> I gotta tell you, that three minutes is money, okay? I have a YouTube video on the whole idea, if you like. So, if your hip flexors are tight, um, please go into the my YouTube account and look up where I have my hip flexor stretch. Now I have, it's funny because people kind of get on me, even at certs, about how I'm so particular about how to, you know, do the hip flexor stretch. People put their hand on the high knee and I'll go, stop doing that. Don't do that. And it's just because I think it's so important that you're, you know, you're stretching the hip flexor. So yes, a hang, the seated, the, the sit in the gobble squat bottom position, 
hip flexor stretch left, hip flexor stretch right, might be a real good way for you to go back in the day. One other thing I want you to think about, and I'm not seeing it in your notes, though obviously, I mean, it seems like you got a good, it seems like you have some good insights here. Uh, gentle listener, sometimes when I'm reading questions, uh, someone will have a very tight question like Harrison has, and I'll, and I feel like I'm nodding along, like we're in a conversation, like, oh, okay, I know what you mean. Uh, and sometimes I'll read a question and be like, okay, I don't, I don't really know what, you know, what the problem is. Harrison's is good. Walking, walking is money after a workout, uh, Stu McGill in his book, The Gift of Injury, talks about, you know, how important walking is. And I'm just tossing it out to you, but I think it might be a really good idea for you to include some extra walking after your workout. So here's your perfect workout in the future. Are you ready, Harrison? Okay, well, let's, let's make it perfect, perfect. Even better than perfect. I want you to start with a one-minute meditation. Whew, count your breaths. I like to get about six in a minute. Hang for 30 seconds, sit for 30 seconds. Take out your take out your to-do list and just think about so far, have I been focused on my goals today? Oh, don't think just lofty goals. Think, you know, the things that are important to me. Have I been doing the things that are important to me? Boom, good. Then get five to 10 minutes of Turkish get-ups in. Get your swings in. Repeat those stretches with the hip flexor stretch. Walk out the door for 45 minutes. And while you're walking, what you'll notice is the meditation and that little bit of goal setting, you'll probably start writing that email that you need to write. You might write that article you need to write. You might come up with a, a better shopping list than the one you thought you had. You might rearrange your schedule so that you do this, that, and this. I tell you, Harrison, it can be money. These were good questions today. Uh, Thank you all for your questions. Uh, each and every week I sit down here and I answer them. This week was episode 212 and I, I am honored to be able to do this every week for you. As a reminder, if you have questions, send them to podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. I'll sit down here each week and do my best to answer every question you have. And until next time, Let's all keep on lifting and learning. Thank you.